Hey, what's up everyone? This is Jack from the Cardboard Herald doing kind of a quasi-casual Friday, quasi-quarantine solo diary segment, both two ongoing segments that we do around here. Casual Friday is normally my conversations with other people just kind of about open-ended subjects, sometimes top 10 lists, sometimes it's going to be on a focused individual topic, whatever. And then the quarantine solo diary is me talking about solo games. Well, since I'm doing a time top 10 list on solo games, I thought it would be fitting to make it this open discussion format, but just me, because we're talking about solo games, or I should say games that I have played solo. There is a distinction between solo games and solo variants to multiplayer games for a lot of you. I'm just lumping it all in together. Also, you should know that this is my personal top 10. These are the games that I most enjoy playing by myself, and I haven't played all games, and these lists are entirely subjective, so if your favorite game isn't on here, it's because it's a terrible game and you should feel bad. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. Number 10 is Clans of Caledonia. Yeah, this is one of my favorite Euros to come out in the last five or so years. Just kind of a, a straight old school economic Euro, but a bunch of pieces on a map and build up an engine. Now, there is kind of an interesting way to interpret this as a solo game because you have the default variant that's in the game itself. And then there's also a very popular fan variant, which I enjoy quite a bit. And then there's also an in-development official solo Automa variant that is very complex. And in truth, I like the vanilla version the best. Yeah, the other stuff is cool and it makes it feel closer to the actual multiplayer experience by simulating the actions of an opponent. But I think the kind of hands-off approach to the vanilla mode, just trying to get as much money as you can, or rather as much points as you can by the end of the game, just makes it a very fluid, easy, approachable game, which a lot of Euros don't have that kind of solo capability. Whereas you start adding in all these Automa variants, they may be closer to that multiplayer experience, but bring with it much more management and complexity. Number nine is a game that I love solo and actually don't very much care for as a multiplayer game, and that's Set a Watch, a game where you are controlling, as a solo player, a ragtag band of four adventurers in a fantasy land. That sounds kind of generic, but feels tonally different than a lot of the stuff out there. The way the game works is that these heroes are going to take turns setting the watch and having one person, one of the members of the group, off trying to take care of some runic, magical, barrier, sealing of ancient evil type of thing. Whatever. One homie is out of play. The other three are going to be doing uh, stuff to manipulate this row of monsters that's getting ever closer, and you have near-perfect information. There are random elements to the cards that are going to get drawn, as well as the dice, but the amount of utility that you have at your disposal, the asymmetric powers of the heroes, the way that their individual special powers are allocated and re-equipped, and the fact that there's more than just four heroes available makes for an interesting and unique puzzle that is very empowering as a solo game and sometimes that's what I want is kind of a, a heady puzzle to work through with all these different capabilities whereas in the multiplayer it kind of suffers because all that information is out there it is extremely susceptible to quarterbacking so set a watch awesome solo game, not so great as a multiplayer game, and the game could use a little bit of polishing up on the rules. Make sure that you use the FAQ online, which clears up the far too many muddy bits that you'll come across as you play the game. Number eight is 
Everdell. Everdell is an awesome worker placement game, but what I most like about it is that the worker placement is translated particularly well into solo gameplay. It's a, a nice bit of balance between the ease of just kind of doing your own thing that you normally do in a game and a little bit of interference on the part of this Automa pawn that is just mucking up the, the streamline ability of the things that you want to do. Essentially throwing the, the the wrench into your cogs to make sure that you don't reach the steamrolling perfection that you would hope that you'd be able to achieve in the way that playing against multiplayer opponents would be messing with you. But in this case, it's just very easy to go through. It's very polished. And Everdell is just such a brilliant and vibrant and bright game. And as the expansions have come out, it's added a lot more of replayability and variability. I think it just makes for a beautiful, beautiful solo game. Now, speaking of municipal furry critter fantasy, we're coming in next with Tiny Towns. Now, this is one of the more concise games on the list here. You could play a solo game of Tiny Towns in probably about 20 minutes, but it flips the normal gameplay of Tiny Towns, which has the auctioneer, auction person, the person with the little tiny adorable wooden hammer calling out the cube that everyone gets to place, and replaces that with three cards from a deck, which will have individual colors of cubes, and you'll just take one of those cards, put it on the bottom of the deck, and place that cube, replacing it with another third card, and then you just cycle through the entire deck, always putting a card on the bottom of the deck, placing the cube, doing the normal Tiny Town stuff in exactly the same way. This gives you a different puzzle than what is normally the challenge in Tiny Towns, but it translates so well. And if you're looking for a game that just is very easy to set up and knock out in a small amount of time, or better yet, you lay it out and then you just play three or four games back to back, and Tiny Towns does something that so few solo games do, and I absolutely love it. Now at number six, I feel like a lot of you are going to feel betrayed because you know me as a hardcore Tolkien enthusiast, but number six is Marvel Champions, the fantasy flight games update to the Lord of the Rings LCG system. Now, don't get me wrong, I very much like the Lord of the Rings LCG, and I know that it has this robust and very nuanced system in which you can play through all these adventures. There's so much content out there, but honestly, FFG is kind of chokeholding the Lord of the Rings LCG, and its future is currently undetermined, and I kind of dig the real streamlined nature and fast and easy deck construction of Marvel Champions such that even though I like both, I find myself tending to go to Marvel Champions more often now. But if anything, this listing is to say that if you like real nuanced card play, but you kind of dig the Marvel Champion system, then go check out the Lord of the Rings LCG and vice versa. If you like Lord of the Rings LCG and you're like, yo, I like the Marvel movies, then definitely check out Marvel Champions. They're similar, albeit very different beasts. You know what? Marvel made the cut on this one. Which brings us into Wingspan. And when deciding on the games to put onto this list, of course I needed to bring in some Automa Factory because they have done some of the greatest Automa player development that has happened in the last several years. Automa Factory is, of course, the company that pairs so often with Stonemaier Games, bringing all kinds of different approaches to automated players, and they have been really at the forefront of bringing solo gaming to the mainstream without the monumental success of games like Viticulture and Scythe, you wouldn't have as many people experimenting with solo gameplay, and it helps that it's so damn polished. Now, 
if I were going to only pick one for this list, which I did choose to only pick one for this list, even though Viticulture, oh, so close, made it onto the list, either in place of Wingspan or as a separate entry altogether, I decided, you know what, let's just fawn over the Automa Factory in one game. And truth be told, I haven't played a game that has so closely interpreted the spirit of playing the game without all the overhead of managing multiplayer as much as Wingspan. It's just so easy to get onto the table. It has a little bit of variability, so you have different challenges, and it facilitates all that bird goodness. I absolutely love it, and it's one of the games that I have played a ton of throughout quarantine this year. Now, number four, which may surprise you because I fawned over it so much, you might have even thought that it is my number one, is Terraforming Mars. I mean, what a fantastic game. And I love the kind of headspace switch of competing over how to get the most points to just fundamentally, how do you terraform the entirety of a planet in a restricted number of rounds? And that recontextualize all the value proposition of all the cards in the game, and it empowers you to really lean into this incredibly streamlined engine, which is the best part of the game in the first place. If I were to evaluate why it's not at the very top of my list, it's because there are some cards that just make zero sense from a solo perspective, and then you also lose out on the awards and milestones, which are a cool aspect of the game. But the flow and function and just overall playability of the game, the exploration into all the different engine capabilities that you can run and the lack of pressure from an opponent that you're competing against means that you have more room to experiment with some of those things where you're playing multiplayer and going, huh, I wonder if I could do an engine like this, but then you go, nah, I'm never going to touch that because it wouldn't be viable enough from the get-go to really compete with this opponent. Well, in solo, you have the ability to do that. Terraforming Mars is fantastic, and it's made even better if you're playing with the Prelude expansion, which is doubly important if you're doing solo. Going on to number three, I'm bringing out the big guns with PAX Premier 2nd Edition. If you've been watching my quarantine solo diary where I talk about all the games that I've been playing in solo and all the different aspects and solo topics and blah, 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 you know how much I love PAX Premier 2nd Edition. It just has such a brilliant, tense puzzle that feels like you have a really good amount of information, but at any moment you could just have it go totally soup sandwich but not in a really unfair way. Also, because of the unique nature of the game with having the ability to switch between the different factions and to feel like you have all kinds of different avenues for interaction, it feels solo capable in a way that most area control games don't, even if I don't know that I would call PAX Premier 2nd Edition an area control game. But there are dudes, well, I guess, clay pieces on a map. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Either way, this is a brilliant design. Ricky Royal's solo mode, the Wakan, is just done so well. It's elegant and refined and challenging and just feels good to have on the table, which is why it's my number three. Now, moving into the top two, we have Gloomhaven. Yes, Gloomhaven, the beautiful, magnificent beast of a box that just has endless amount of playtime capability for you. I have played a lot of this, especially if you've watched this channel, particularly towards the beginning of quarantine, you'll have seen how much of this I played by myself, and I really enjoyed my time. That said, if you are looking to get into solo games and you are kind of on the fence about Gloomhaven, well, good news. The reason this is number two is because there is a much easier to recommend Jaws of the Lion set out there, which is just a fantastic gaming package. Whether you're an experienced or amateur gamer, whatever, it is just a fantastic way of getting into Gloomhaven and kind of feeling 
trying out how to multi-hand a solo game by yourself. Now, I don't particularly like multi-handing a lot of games. I don't like pretending that I'm multiple adventurers, but something about the fluidity of Gloomhaven makes it so it, it feels like your overhead controlling the capabilities, the synergies between the adventures that you're playing as, as opposed to acting as two independent parties. That said, I don't think that I personally would ever have the brain capability in order to play three hero Gloomhaven all by myself, but two player or two hero Gloomhaven is definitely my number two. So much depth to that freaking game. But Bringing us to number one, now this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. Spirit Island, are you kidding me? This is just one of the most perfect games to come out <laughs> in all time. It is so good. And the reason why it works so well with Solo is the overall experience of playing Spirit Island with multiple players translates beautifully into an individual game. Now, if you are wanting to single hand this, you can with one little tiny island, just testing the capabilities of your spirit. It works wonderfully and you have all kinds of different options and challenges that you can modify the parameters of the game with and it feels really satisfying to lean into the particular strengths of your spirit and feel like you were victorious or not but if you're not playing on a high difficulty level then more than likely you're going to find a way to be victorious and if you're not well then reduce the difficulty level you figure it out but that wonderful beautiful feeling of synergizing two different spirits together and seeing their chaotic capabilities interact you could still do that in solo and not have too brain bending of a time similar to the the uh, statement i had about gloomhaven i don't ever want to play this with more than two spirits on my own and if truth be told i prefer to play with just one spirit really leaning into what they can do and just seeing what i can wring out of their particular flavor of spirititude but on the other hand playing with two spirits to see their synergies if you want to have a really heady time and have a really nuanced puzzle to work with it's available and not that much more difficult than playing with one spirit on its own it feels expansive it feels monumental and at the same time it feels elegant and refined with all kinds of different imaginative synergies between theme and mechanics and Spirit Island is absolutely my favorite game to play solo and that's our list thank you so much for watching but I want to hear from you. What are the games that I didn't include on this list? What are the games that I have listed that you haven't played but you might be considering to play now? And what games would you like to see solo variants for? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks again for watching. I've been Jack for the Cardboard Herald.